Okay, we are entering a season of uh, unprecedented uh, change, unprecedented opportunity, and unprecedented need uh, that for Christians to be praying, interceding, and focused in our desires for God's will. As, yes. As Pastor Dina pointed out, um, regardless of November, I think our nation, we've, we've recognized that 2020 has, has changed us. Uh, there's never, there's no going back to, to the semblance of what it was. I mean, I, I see that the, the, the new normal has been established, and there are a bunch of new normals that are being pressed down. And our new normal is never, it's not new to us. It's just a re-emphasis on what God wants from us. And as so our, the message title here is 10 Weeks of Prayer, Intercessing, and Fasting for the 2020 Election. And yes, this is a focused prayer, intercession, and fasting towards God's will on November 3rd, 2020. And whatever that will is, whatever happens on that day, regardless of result of election, that we as Christians are ready to move forward and to continue to build and to grow God's kingdom, whatever our land that we're walking through may look like. And so part of this is, and I'm just going to want to do an introduction to this today. We're going to mainly talk about prayer and fasting, but I, and this may go a little bit long because there's a lot of material. And I prayed and I'm like, Lord, you know, what should I cut? He goes, nothing. All of I, everything that he's got to be said today, he wanted said. And so I am going to try to not to belabor certain points, but I am passionate about this. I think there's a lot of people in here who are passionate about this topic, and we're going to spend some time being prepared and focused together as one body and mind, spirit, and focus towards God's will to affect the world around. And so let me go ahead and, dear Heavenly Father, please uh, open our minds and hearts <clears throat> to the power of prayer, the power of fasting, the power of a united body of believers praying towards your goal of your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, your desires are supreme to everything. And so help us to, to focus and get your desires to be our desires. And so, Lord, I just pray that you bless this day, bless these words, let them be yours, and let your words speak loudly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before we even start talking about 2020 elections, we need to establish one key fact to keep our minds in, in the right frame of mind. You and I are foreigners and nomads walking through this land but we have purpose and power. All right? We are foreigners and nomads. Hebrews 11:13 talks about the great people of faith and all of the promises that God had poured into them and given them and, and, and you know there's all of these visions of what God's going to do and 11:13 sums it up says this all these people died still believing what God had promised them but they did not receive what was promised but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it they agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. You and I are a foreigner and a nomad walking through this place right now as we speak. We are just more, we are, we are not permanent residents of the land that we are presently in. We are merely foreigners and nomads walking on waiting for an eternal destination which is eternity in heaven with God our Father that is our home that is our allegiance that is our primary God the Father Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit they are our ultimate authority and that is where all of our allegiance ought to lie but God has blessed us to put us in a land that we are walking through, that we are blessed in the land in which God put us, in which I'm calling the United States of America. We know that we have been blessed to be put in this nation at this time of history because it has been a nation that has been blessed like no other nation in history. 
And if everybody who hates America doesn't like it, I dare you. I've been into other countries. I have been to other places in this world. If you think there's a better place out there, go find it. I dare you. Go find it. For everybody who hates this nation and what it stands for, you know nothing. I'm sorry. It, right? I mean, for all, anybody who's done traveling across the world, we have seen, I have seen pits. I have seen hell on earth. And I, I, you know what? I shouldn't state it because hell is going to be a multiple, multiples, much more than any of the worst places in, America, or in the world that I've ever seen. But we have been blessed. And if you're on our sheet there, you can say, you know, we have been blessed with, with freedoms, you know. Uh, we, we have been found at this place, this nation that we, we, we're, we're being placed in, that we're for, surging through. It was founded on, on Ju, uh, Christian Judeo principles. In other words, it was founded with God at the center of it. It really was. The founding documents and our founding fathers used biblical principles in order to establish the foundation of government that we live under today. Our nation was indeed founded as a Christian-based nation. And that's just one blessing. Can you imagine? I mean, of all the places that we could have been born and God could have placed us, he could have placed us into a place that had no Christian foundation whatsoever, and we would have to be walking through that land. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters who are walking through many lands that have no love for Christ whatsoever and are just outright hostile to them. Be praying for people in Nigeria right now who are being murdered wholesale. Christians who are being murdered just because they're Christians by people in that nation. We need to be praying for those foreigners who are walking through lands that are dangerous. We need to be praying for the Christians in China who are being told that you have to deny Christ or we take away your government benefits. That's going on in real time. I shared a post that, that hospitals are now murdering babies because they're born of the wrong ethnic group or of the wrong people group. Government mandated killing of babies because they don't fit what they want. And America's got problems, huh? Oh, we're not perfect, but by golly, we know that we've been blessed with a beautiful land to walk through. We have great liberties and freedoms. I'm able to stand here at this pulpit and preach and broadcast this message without fear of government interference coming in here and saying, you may not say that. We have freedoms the way it stands right now. Ah, we are blessed. Those of us who are in the greatest want have more than some of the richest people in the world. Our poor, our poor live well. They don't recognize it because they're trying to compare themselves to the neighbor. But even our poorest have opportunities to be fed, housed, clothed, there are job opportunities out there. There are, if those who are suffering from medical issues, there are opportunities to be fixed, to be cared for. We are blessed. Amen. But we are foreigners walking through a blessed land. In order for us to pray God's will upon the people, we need to get the right focus. Remembering that we are foreigners, but we are blessed to be here. And so, before I jump too far ahead, we're going to talk about Jeremiah, where the, the exiles from Israel were sent into Babylon. And they were given the directive by God through Jeremiah that you need to pray for your city and the nation where you are. You need to pray and bless that nation because if it prospers, you prosper. God says, you know, focus on me. But wherever you are, you need to be praying for that nation that you're walking through. But one more thing before we leave the foreign land that we're walking through and we've been blessed with. This nation and its governance was designed on one basic fact. And John Adams captures it, period. Dot, and I'm going to capture it. I'm going to see what he says. He says, our constitution, our form of government, our whole basis on being able to be a nation was made only for a moral and a religious people. Only for a moral and religious people. 
And it is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. And when he says moral and religious, he had one religion in mind, one thought in mind, and that was Christianity. It was the foundation of Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Bible that is the basis of our nation. If you reject God and you reject Jesus, then you cannot, our government cannot and will not successfully govern you. It is impossible to govern the people based upon a, on a constitutional republic as our constitution laid out with the checks and balances and the, and the people electing their leaders and putting them into power. If they don't know Jesus Christ and if they don't know God, well, all we got to do is look at the news. We know what's going on. Our nation has went from a Christian foundation to a post-Christian nation and is currently pressing forward to become an anti-Christian nation. And if we wonder why our problems are, why we can't govern, well, it's based upon the fact that we don't have Christianity restraining our behaviors. The Constitution depended upon people to be able to act in a moral manner that did not reward and, and, and reward selfish attitudes and immoral behavior. What does a moral and religious people do? They do three things. First, we are able to regulate our own behavior. With Jesus Christ and knowing that we've answered to God, we can go, I, I shouldn't do that. Because if I do that, I'm going to be dishonoring God and I am going to be putting my future at risk. I'm going to be hurting people. I'm going to be doing the opposite of what God wants me to do. Because I have Jesus Christ in my heart, I'm able to control my impulses, usually, not perfectly, but it certainly does a whole lot better with not, but I didn't have Jesus in my heart. We're able to regulate, we're able to control our behavior. When you reject it, you see what happens. Go down to Portland, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to find a whole lot of Christians in that mob. And I'm being harsh. Maybe I'm being harsh. But I, I'm telling you the truth. Where you reject Christ, you result in mobs that are controlled by worldly passions. So moral and religious people are able to self-regulate, but they also take care of those in need. For the longest time, people cared for their own in our communities. It was the community coming together to take care of people in need. It wasn't people running to a mother government with their hands out saying, please give me, give me, give me, I need. People would recognize the need of their neighbor and out of the love of Jesus Christ in their heart would provide help where help was needed. But we have walked away from that. We've retracted God. And so the government has continued to take what the church used to do and says, okay, we'll take care of the poor now. We'll take care of the needy. We'll take care of this. Don't, church, you get out. Government will in. And how has that worked out? It has not worked out. Because every dollar that goes up to the government to get back down to this person here, they take their, let's go with the $100. For every hundred dollars that goes up to the government, they take their good 20, maybe 30 dollars off the top for them to create their own jobs and to fund their needs. Then they create another organization down here who has its leaders who take up, oh yeah, we're going to advocate for the poor. They have their own huge overhead. They take their dollars off the top. And by the time the money that went up to help the poor gets down to the poor, it's pennies on the dollar. Because it's not God's design. It's not God's design. It is you and I who are supposed to be caring for the poor out there. But because the government's taken over, we've become calloused. And we don't see the poor. We don't see the need. We don't help. Because we've allowed the world to get flipped upside down on us. And we got to get that fixed. A Christian nation recognizes that we take care of the needy. And we seek to love and care for each other. That's what a moral and religious people do. And our government was designed on the need for these kind of people. And yet, unfortunately, most people in our world today have rejected that and have gone where we see where we're at. Yeah, I'm passionate about our land we're walking through. 
but I'm more passionate about what God's design was and what we are capable of when we put ourselves back underneath the authority of God, what we could do as a nation again. If we got ourselves focused and we were worshiping and doing Christianity right and our government wasn't interfering with our ability to do things right, could you imagine the, the great things that could happen? The great things that could be done based upon Christian love. Our land that we're walking through used to be friendly to us as Christians. It has gone to not caring a lick about us, to pushing forward to being anti-Christian. Very clearly, I think most of us are very clear in recognizing that both parties have its massive failures. I will never defend the Republican Party. I, 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 I'm, just, you know, transparent. I'm Republican, so you know I'm not hiding anything here. Okay, I vote that way. They got their issues. We don't have compassion the way the Republicans don't express compassion the way they need to. They don't see the need and the plight of the needy the way they need to. They have a hardness of their heart that does not make them perfect. But in 2020, there's another party that, 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 that the major movement behind it is anti-God. There is a decision that's going to be made this year. And we're going to talk about this over the next 10 weeks. We're going to talk about the hard issues. Well, Pastor, what happens when you've got a person who's really got a morally bankrupt character? He's not a nice guy. He doesn't behave real well. I have to either choose him or I have to choose this other guy who looks really nice but his policies are godless. His beliefs are anti-God. Pastor, what am I supposed to do? We're going to talk about that because God has guidance for us on those issues. But that's what we're stuck with, right? We, we, you know, the, I'm sitting there trying to talk about one party. No, this is not easy. I'm not making this easy. It's difficult. It's hard. People are soul searching. You've got Christians who are highly divided because of this. I ain't voting for that guy because he is nasty. So I'm going to vote for this guy, which I'm looking at going, why would you vote for that person? Because they're godless. And you've and you got this debate going on out there. This is the, you know, you've got the church who's caught here. But if we don't, well, if we can't talk about it here, if we can't go and search the scriptures for it and find God's answers and leave it at his feet and say, God, I don't know what to do. Please leave it to me. Reveal this to me. I need your help. Then we, there's no purpose because this is where Christianity hits the road in our world. This is applied Christianity. And that's the reason this is so important. These aren't going to be easy. And this topic isn't easy. And what I'm saying sounds awfully divisive. But I'm trying to lay out the facts in a balanced way the best I can. So grace, please. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to say something that ticks everybody off. Just sometime, somewhere. I'm going to take somebody off. I'm going to take myself off as I talk up here. <laughs> because God's call is beyond Republican, it's beyond Democrat, it's beyond America. It is my better reason. It is far beyond simplicity. It is to God's will. And it's to make sure where is our ultimate allegiance? Will we seek God over everything? And that's where we're going next. Go into the next slide, please. See, our duty is to prayer and intercede. That's what God's given us. We are foreigners passing through a land. And yes, we have a lot of emotion wrapped up because this land has been good to us. It has blessed us. And it has indeed had these great things. And so we have a loyalty to it. But ultimately, 
Our allegiance belongs to God. We've got to keep that picture in mind. And we need to be praying and interceding and communicating with God over this next 10 weeks that we ask him to reveal his will, to make things clean, to intercede unto the, upon the world's behalf, upon our nation's behalf, upon our land's behalf, because that's what God has called us to do. Again, in Jeremiah, I don't know, I lost that scripture somewhere. I'm just going to simply summarize it. He says, pray for the land you're in. And it's actually in your hand out there, down towards the bottom, if you were to look at that last paragraph. There we go. 29, Jeremiah 29, 7. Thank you. Upon a whole other things, God says this, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. We need to pray for our land. We need to pray that God intercedes. We want to pray God's will, but we want to make sure that his kingdom is over all. And so how do we do this? We must pray. And I think we're going to find out that prayer may not just be enough. Go ahead and go back to the next last one, please. And prayer is simple. I think a lot of us make it hard. But prayer is simply talking to God, communicating with God. It's supposed to be a two-way conversation. That's where it gets difficult because I don't listen a whole lot. I'm busy talking at God. I need, I need, I need, listen to me. Here's what, please, 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 reveal, reveal, reveal. And God's like sitting there trying to respond to me, and, and he can't get a word in edgewise. Because I'm busy talking, 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 and by the time I'm done talking, I just hang up the receiver before he can tell me anything. Communicating with God, prayer is an act of lifting up needs to him and listening to him. Don't forget to listen. Our nation is desperate for people to listen. Do you, have you ever noticed that 95% of the people out there, they're desperate for somebody just to listen to them? I know Mary knows this. She probably gets a lot of phone calls from people with problems. They, they just want to unload and talk and talk and talk. I went to the, the uh, nursing home when I was there. And they just if you just went into a room and sat down and let people talk, they will tell you everything. But so few of us, we're so busy wanting to tell our own story. I'm praying, like I said, with God. We're so busy trying to tell God all these great things he already knows <laughs> that we won't shut up and listen. <laughs> and God says, I got something. I got an answer for you. So it's communicating. It's simple, but it's also multifaceted. That's a fancy word. It's kind of like a diamond, you know? There's so many elements of praying. You have intercessory prayer. You got this kind of prayer. You got this. You can do it this way. You can do it that way. You can, you know, there's all these ways that you can pray. Don't worry about those right now, okay? You know, just to communicate with God and, and keep it simple. Don't, don't go too difficult because there's a, you can read books on prayer, right? There are massive books out there on the, on the topic of prayer. Let's just keep it simple. We're going to be talking to God about our needs for the world, and we're going to be asking his will be done for the 2020 election, period, dot. And it's not optional, by the way. There's no option. God doesn't say, pray if you want to. No, he wants us constantly. Pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians right over here on our wall, it says it right there. Pray without ceasing. God loves to hear. He wants you communicating with him. Pray. It's not optional. Go ahead now. But there's two focuses I do want to make sure that we focus in on here. 1 Timothy 2, 1, 7, because we need to pray specifically for our leaders. There is a biblical mandate for us to be praying for our elected leaders and the next generation and who's coming behind. We ought to be praying. And 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2 gives us a nice phrase here. It says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. I like that. He says, cover all people need to be prayed for. But he says, ask God to help them intercede on their behalf. That's a big phrase right there. And give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. Kings and all who are in authority. 
so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. I don't feel that my life is all that quiet and I don't believe our lives are marked with all that much dignity right now. Maybe because we're not praying for our leaders the way we ought to be. Finger pointing right here first, okay? We need to be praying for our leaders. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Look how much power is in there. We have some of the most godless leaders. What if we were to pray honestly and, and, and with all fervency this prayer? Pray this way to intercede upon their behalf. Intercede upon that person, that elected official that's driving you nuts. Even Pray for the ones who are blessed out there and make sure you lift them up and say, God, please bless these people. Please give them wisdom. Give them discernment. Give them your will, Lord. And then see how things change. But First Timothy, we need to. On part, one of the emphasis items is we need to keep First Timothy in our minds, and it says to pray for all, not just for Republicans, not just for Democrats. All. Let's get ourselves above the fray, and pray from God's standpoint over the big picture. And in the second part, I think is we need to be persistent. Two emphasis items. Pray for our leaders, national, state, and local, and be persistent in your prayer. In Luke 18, 1 through 8, it tells about the story about the persistent widow who went before the king, or before a judge, I think. I think it was a judge. Yes. And basically kept pestering him for justice and kept going back at him with her needs and laying them before him over and over and over again. And finally he says, oh my gosh, just give her what she wants so she'll shush up. That's basically what he says. And Jesus used this example as God's a whole, your father's a whole lot like that. He doesn't mind you pestering him. Actually, it almost kind of challenges you to pester him and be persistent about your prayers so that he will then go, well, boy, they really do want this. I will answer that prayer. Up here he says, so don't you think, remember this judge, he didn't care about this woman whatsoever. But he gave in to her. So this is the response Jesus says. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him once a day? For a few minutes and an hour? No, it says, who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep, you know, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Our persistence in prayer is reflective on how much faith we have in God. I used to think that, well, I have so much faith in God, I'll just utter my prayer once. He has it now. I don't need to pester him anymore. I have so much faith in God that I'm not going to ask him anymore. I'm done. I'm a little off here, aren't I? This verse would say, God wants to hear from me multiple times. He wants to see persistence in me. See, it's not doubt, it's persistence. Big difference. Be persistent in our prayers. So we need to pray for our leaders, and we need to be persistent as we pray. All right. Jim, you want to read this scripture up here? <laughs> Second Chronicles 7.14. <laughs> This is a great prayer. This is a good word on prayer. It says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. This was very specific to the Israelites of the time. However, the principle of this prayer remains true to the day. And there's a whole sermon in here, so I'm going to cut to the chase. People who are called by my name now is the church. We are the people who are called by God's name. That's his church. It says who are called by name, if they will humble themselves, empty ourselves of our self-centered desires. We need to humble ourselves before God, taking away ourselves and thinking of God's ways and his desires as more important than our own. That's what this humbling means. And pray and seek my face. He goes, talk to me. Remember, if people will, who my church, 
will humble themselves and then talk to me and seek me. In other words, not only just talk to God, but actually want to talk to God. How many people have prayed and go, I, I'm so mad at you right now, God, but I'm going to talk to you anyway. We don't pray to God out of obligation. We pray to God because we love him and he wants to listen to us and we want to talk to him. So we need to pray and seek his face. So we want to be, hey God, I want to see you. Please reveal yourself to me and turn from their wicked ways. We can't just sit there and live our life unchanged. We do need to change and turn away. So as a church, we need to make sure that we have turned away from what is separating us from God and are looking truly at him and we get rid of all the extra junk in our life turn from their wicked ways so if we do all of these things god says i will hear from heaven and i will forgive their sins and because i am doing that for my church i can also heal the land our healing will result in a healing that far exceeds what this building has when you're healed and restored you take healing and restoration out the door to your friends, to your co-workers, to your family. It's a slow process, but it's an amazing promise. And fortunately, there is a spiritual discipline that helps us with this because I don't think just praying in and of itself sometimes kind of gets lost. We need to amp up the volume. We need to amp up like a laser our focus and our and, and, and our our desire upon God, and that is through the fist, the the spiritual discipline called fasting. Okay, and nobody running out of here. Good. So many people hear the word fasting and they're like, no. It is a not a popular subject upon many Christians. It's not often practiced as the second point talks about because this is a thing that will first and foremost, a lot of people when you say, well, I'm going to fast, there's this legalistic perception. Oh, you're trying to follow a bunch of rules and you're trying to legally do something that makes God do what you want him to do. There's, you're just being a legalist when you fast. I think really what the problem is at the heart of it is people don't want to fast because there's an absolute disdain in any idea of denying myself anything. That's me. I don't want to deny myself food. I don't want to deny myself caffeine. I don't want to deny myself social media or television. or or Because historically, fasting was going without food for a limited time so that you spend greater attention in spiritual matters. So basically, you deny doing something that, you would, you know, that was satisfying to yourself and say, God, instead of satisfying me, I'm giving you this time. I'm investing this time to your spiritual, whatever you got me to pray for. Peter, you kind of you helped me out last week when you talked about Peter would get this thing that he just, I need to give, I need to fast this thing for this person. See, he had the spirit and he was listening to the Holy Spirit. And so he says, okay, I'm going to deny this myself this. It's not deny, but he's, I'm choosing not to do this so that I can spend more time doing this. And God answered prayers. I'll have him testify on this later on about the, the answered prayers. But because of his obedience of fasting, he interceded for somebody else and the prayer was answered for them. There is power in prayer and fasting put together. There's an amazing power. And I don't tap into it. I've, I've fasted. I can count on one hand the number of times I've done a real, uh, like a three-day fast of some sort. Um, you know, I've, I've done maybe a lunchtime fast countless times, but those are pretty wussy. <laughs> Come on, right? I'm going to give up lunch, Lord. You know, half the times we skip lunch anyway. And so it's real easy to say I'm going to fast one day. No, this is a commitment <laughs> to do something that is honoring to God. And it is a sacrifice. And it is an expectation of Jesus today. He says it very clearly in Luke. Well, Jesus himself fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, my goodness. And after that, he got tested by this. Can you imagine fasting, being that hungry after 40 days, and then you get tested by the enemy with all these things? Jesus fasted for 40 days. He demonstrated that he could fast. 
In Luke 5:35, Jesus states his expectations that his disciples would fast after Jesus had been taken away. He says, well, I'm, he didn't say I'm doing away with the spiritual discipline. He, they're just not doing it now because they got everything they need right here. There's going to be a time where they're going to need to fast in order to have what they need. And in Acts 13, it talks about uh, the, the practice of fasting before Paul and Barnabas were sent out on their first missionary journey, that they fasted and prayed. And so the, 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 the concept of fasting is not gone. It still exists in New Testament scripture very clearly. Okay, so once again, this really isn't optional. And I read an article. I cheated, okay, because there's a you know there's a lot to, to do when it comes to, to scripture. But I read an article and it summarized seven reasons that you fast, seven purposes, the way you can focus for a fast. And I'm gonna quickly go through these things. The first one is you fast to prepare for a ministry. If you feel like you're being called into a ministry, you need to spend time in prayer and fasting before you accept and make sure that you're doing God's will. Because there's a lot of counterfeit calls. We see lots of pastors who have been called into ministry. They did not hear the Lord clearly. They heard somebody else. And I had to make sure that I made sure. You know, we, are you sure you want me doing this, Lord? And it was a time of giving up to, to pray and fast, to prepare for ministry. The second reason you fast is you seek God's wisdom. You can give a fast to pray and say, God, you know, what is your wisdom? This was the Paul and Barnabas when they fasted and prayed before they put elders for the churches into place. They were praying for God's wisdom to make sure that they put the right people in place. They wanted to make sure they had God's will. You can fast to show grief. Nehemiah shows this, where Nehemiah mourned and fasted and prayed when he learned that Jerusalem walls were torn down. And he goes, Lord, I am so sorry. The grief that he felt caused him to go without so that he could spiritually pray to God during that time. You can pray for a seek of deliverance and protection. This was from, from Ezra where they were getting ready to go from the, from the exile land back into Jerusalem. Before they went on that trek, they said, let's pray and fast for God's protection because they were going unprotected across a whole lot of hostile area. And they said, we need God's favor. So they prayed and fasted and God provided the protection. You can pray to repent. Remember Jonah? After the, the guys in Nineveh all got the message that their whole place was going to be destroyed, they had everybody in town, including the animals. I don't know if that's biblical or not, but the animals had to fast. They didn't even get food or water for three days because they knew the destruction was coming down upon them. They were repenting from their sins. Oh, my Lord, America needs a three-day fast like that now, don't we? Yes, amen. But I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of people to join, but guess what? We must fast in a response and intercession yeah. we need to be there but it's you, you fast to, to repent from sorrow you repent you fast to gain victory uh, this is in judges where they had lost you know this is in judges 20 26 for instance uh, the israelites were fighting the, the benjamin the benjamites and they had gotten their tail whipped lost like twenty thousand people in a day and the israelites go God's not with us. Something's wrong. And so they fasted and prayed and said, God, we're sorry. We need your victory. We need you to be with us or we're not going to win. And they fasted and prayed for victory. And the next day they were granted that victory after they had done this. And the last thing is you can fast to worship God. And that's really the heart of it is when you fast, you are just focusing on God and you're worshiping him. Every one of these acts right here to prepare for ministry, to seek his wisdom, to show grief and deliverance and protection, repentance, gaining victory. All of those are worship actions to God saying, I love you. I worship you. I know that you can provide everything. Lord, we need that. And I tell you what, I can see six of the seven reasons very clearly that you can be fasting for over the next 10 weeks. We need to pray to seek God's wisdom. We have a tough choice. We need his wisdom. Our nation needs his wisdom. We need to show grief from our current state. We need to seek deliverance and protection from the enemy's attacks upon us. We need to seek repentance for sorrow and the things that we've done. We need to seek to gain a victory for God's sake. We need to seek all those things. We can pray. And as we are praying and fasting, we can have all of these things. And ultimately, we need to be worshiping God always. There's never a time that we could pray. If, you're, if you fast to praise God, he's going to 
He's going to be happy. And who knows all the blessings that's going to flow down from that action. But you don't fast as a manipulative tool. That's the call. That's the hard part. We fast with, all right, Lord, I'm going to fast for you for this reason, and I expect you got to give me what I want on this. Don't seek your will. You are seeking his at all times. You can ask in our prayer. Don't be wrong about that. But if God says, nope, stop persisting in that. Because if he says no, and it's clearly no, he's got, a, he's got his own plan and his own will. And you say, Lord, your will be done. That's the ultimate of all giving. And so you have prayer, which we need to keep simple. Communicating with God. Fasting just means give up some of your own Something you find valuable and say, God, I think you're more valuable than this. And I want to give this up for you so that we can talk more. So that's prayer and fasting at the simplest form, right? Anybody disagree on that? Why do we have to make things so much difficult? Every, every time I've studied this, it becomes so much harder. No, I'm going to give up something so I can talk with God. That's it? Yes. <laughs> that's it. And so now let's put these things together. Daniel 10. I love this story. Daniel 10. I'm going to try to go through this thing. It starts off that in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar had another vision. He understood that the vision concerning events uh, concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. By the way, these are times that are still coming. These times have not yet come. Daniel saw a vision of the end times that we still have not yet seen. So when this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three weeks. At that time, I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. That was his way. That was his fast for three weeks of time of prayer. He says, I'm not going to eat any rich food. I am not going to have any meat. I'm not going to drink any wine, and I'm not going to put on lotion. That was his way of fasting. That was what he says. If I do these things, when I do these things, I'm going to be able to spend more time spiritually focused upon God. That was Daniel's fast. So he had been fasting in this place. It seemed like the purpose for his was mourning. He was sorrowful for what he was seeing, and he fasted in response to that one particular thing for three weeks. Three weeks. That's pretty cool. But that's not the end of the story. And so on April 23rd, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning. His eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze. And his voice roared like the vast multitude of people. That sounds a whole lot like Jesus in Revelation, don't it? I think it's fair to say that Jesus revealed himself strictly to Daniel at that time. What a vision that had to be. Can you imagine that? After those three weeks, all of a sudden, Jesus appears. Daniel says, I, I only I, <laughs> Daniel saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing. Had they not fasted? I wonder why. Daniel got a special gift because of his commitment and dedication, I think. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So whatever it was they did not see, they saw how Daniel responded to what he was saying. And they were so frightened by Daniel's response, they took off on him. They were, wow, whatever he was seeing, we're out of here. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale. I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak when I heard the sound of his voice. I fainted and lay there, my face to the ground. Bam! He just fainted straight on his face. <laughs> Whew. In the presence of Jesus. Now, 
There's a shift. Just then a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up for I have sent to you, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this, I stood up still trembling. I think Jesus left here and he sent an angel in replace because there's a whole different... There's the authority of this person is not the same as the first vision. Again, speculative, but it's making sense. So, and being precious to, the, to God. It says, you're precious. Daniel fasted, sought God. He sought after his face. He repented. He was looking for God with everything within him. He is praying, and God says, you are so precious to me. When you pray and when you're fasting, when you're doing things, when you're seeking God, he just looks at you and says, man, you're so precious to me. He, just, he loves you. It makes him so happy to see these things. Precious. And then 12, he says, hey, then he says, don't be afraid to Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself, so this is where I come back in here, verse 12. Then he says, don't be afraid. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come to answer to your prayer. So the very first day Daniel started his prayer and his fast, the prayer was heard by heaven. And this guy was sent on the very first day of the, of the prayer. This angel, this person, was sent to answer Daniel's prayer right then and there. But notice this next phrase. It says, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. There is so much power, and there's so much to that scripture right there. Spiritual, war, spiritual battle and spiritual warfare, it is real. It is happening around you and I right this moment, right above our head. There is a spiritual battle between the angels of God and the enemy around us. There are battles for your mind, for your soul, for your life, for this church, for this town, for this nation. For it. There is a spirit principality for the United States of America. I believe that very firmly. There are the enemies of the devil are not, un, they're not unorganized. They're organized. There was a spirit of the prince of Persia who was battling the spirit. You know, God sent an angel to come down to Daniel. And the enemy himself had the spirit prince who was strong enough to actually push back the angel of God coming down. That's the reason I say that it wasn't Jesus that was held up. Jesus would be like, get out of my way. And been right down there. But the angel himself didn't have the power. And because it was for 21 days that this battle raged. And guess what? How long was Daniel's fast and prayer? 21 days. His prayer and his fasting broke through a spiritual battle happening above him. He had no idea what was going on. But because of his persistence and his dedication and commitment to prayer, God says he, gave, he granted spiritual victory. That's what we can do with the power of Christ being focused in prayer and fasting over these next 10 weeks. We have that power. Do you believe that? Do you recognize it? Are you ready to employ that power? Yes. I am. I think we are. Yes. 2020 has been a year of great distraction, but it's been a and the enemies tried to attack and distract us. But guess what? Because of all these other things, I am more spiritually honed because of the enemy's attacks. All his attacks tried to destroy. And guess what? He just created stronger Christians. The church that has come back and the church that's attending church right now, the Christians who are coming in, we are the warriors. And we are tired and we are focused and we are ready to make an impact upon God's kingdom. The enemy tried to destroy us in 2020 and all he did is mobilize us. He's going to regret what he did because Christ is getting ready to come back and he has a powerful army of Christians ready to attack. Are you ready to attack? 
Well, let's put this to practice. Ten weeks. So, our call to action right here. And the first page is just kind of setting the whole, setting the conditions. It's just kind of explaining the circumstances of what our world is looking like. The second page really contains what we're going to try to be doing together as a focused church. And there are four things that we need to do. The first and foremost thing is that our call to action is that we need to be seeking and yielding to God's will no matter what. We have our desires. We have our dreams. We have our hopes. God does not mind. He does not mind us lifting those up to him and saying, God, we would love to see your mercy and grace extend over this, our, over this land we're walking through. Right? I think we all share that heart. But ultimately, my heart says, I'd love to see that, Lord, but whatever you do, it's perfect. Whatever you have in store, I trust. Even if it doesn't make sense to me, I trust you, Lord, because God has everything in control. So ultimately, the thing is, we must seek and yield God's will above everything else. Political party, national interests, whatever special interest we all might have must take a second seat to what God has in store. But then we need to pray and intercede for God's grace and mercy. God loves everybody, and he wants everybody to come into a relationship with him. We need to keep this focus in mind that our battles are not against flesh and blood, but what? Spiritual principalities. We need to be praying for the flesh, flesh and blood to come into a relationship with Jesus that changes them through a relationship and a transformation that only Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit can bring. So pray and intercede for God's grace and mercy. Because right now, so many people are out there. As I said, you go down to Portland right now and you go into those mobs, you're not going to find a whole lot of Christians but what you're going to find is a whole lot of creations of God that he wants to bring into his kingdom. And he is grieved by what's going on. And so we cannot see these people as our enemy, but as casualties of the enemy. Was that the phrase that we learned last, this last week on the, the thriving in Babylon? Don't see people as the enemy. See people as the these, they're, they're the victims of the enemy. Oh, God's using them. Or not God's using excuse me. The enemy is using them. The enemy is manipulating them. Yes, they're doing evil and they're speaking evil, evil and, and despicable things. But that's the enemy behind them. And we need to be praying first and foremost, grace and mercy. We need to share the heart of God. And we need to stand and speak God's truth. We can love people without giving in on what God has. Yeah. We need to make sure, because God has a design in so many areas of life. And if God's design were followed in the family and in our government and in the world around us and in our church here, if we were to seek God's truth and to behave and say, God, what is your way of doing things? You design things just perfectly. How can I do it better? We're going to find that our world, if we're doing it right, the world can then improve. We need to make sure that we're seeking, seeking and speaking God's truth. Don't sacrifice. You don't sacrifice his truth for the sake of all these things. And last but not least, we need to be full of God's hope and assurance. Oh, people need to see when they look at me and they go on and, they, and when, when I act with them, they should see hope. They should see God's great presence and everything that God has done for me and it should be exuding back out of me all of this hope and all of this assurance that I have in my eternal salvation because of what God's done for me should exude back out to everybody we interact with as a church we should not be a doom and gloom source which unfortunately so many of us I fall into every once in a while I'm doom and gloom it why God's given me perfect hope and assurance. I have nothing to be doom and gloom about. I am not happy to see the way the world's going, and it grieves me, but I'm not doom and gloom. I shouldn't be affected in my spirit. The Holy Spirit bubbling and out. So our four calls to action. Seek his will. Pray and intercede for grace and mercy. Salvations. 
because that's our only hope changed lives by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is the only hope our nation has. We can elect the most perfect legislature in the world, but if the people don't want to listen and they don't want to seek God and they don't want to know Jesus, it won't matter if we have the most perfect thing going on in D.C. or in, in Nashville or even in Greenville City Hall. If the people's hearts aren't changed by God, it ain't going to work. And we need to be standing on that truth and be full of hope and assurance. Our challenge, here you go. Once a day, or not once a day, as God leads you. So everybody's going to be doing something very different, but we're all going to be doing the exact same thing. Does that make sense? Set aside, schedule a daily time of prayer that you're going to give towards the 2020 election and God's purpose for it. If you already set aside time to pray for your family and friends and do some other stuff, add in and it does it. Whatever God tells you, if it's 15 minutes, then it's 15 minutes is perfect. If God says, I need three hours from you, well, then three hours is what you're going to find. Pray, seek, and do what God tells you to do. But make sure that you schedule this time. This is that persistence. If we're praying day after day after day and constantly loving God and lifting up these prayers, that's where we're going to see the John, you know, that the, the, the widow principle come. And God's going to go, okay, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Here, here's your answered prayer. So set aside, set aside a time. I challenge each and every one of you to find and choose a fast for each week. I think it doesn't have to be the same for four, you know, 10 weeks is a long period of time. And so if you have this week, you need to say, God, what do you want me to do to give up? Is there a particular area in my life that you want me to set aside so I can spend time with you and listen to what he is telling you to do? Maybe one week it's not watching TV at night. Maybe one week it's, it's going without lunches, or maybe it's a, a, a sunrise, a sunset, one day, full day fast. Maybe he's going to be calling you on a certain week to take a three-day fast. I don't know. I'm just saying that there's all of these variations. Whatever he's telling you to do is the right fast for you. And we, I just challenge you to do it, because that's the discipline of it all. It's easy to commit, but then it's hard to do. I found it hard to do. See, Peter, he actually kind of, he caught me off guard. He goes, it's not that hard to do because I'm praying to God. And because I'm doing this, it makes me feel good. So I don't feel like I'm giving up anything. I'm like, I'm not looking at this the right way. <laughs> He's challenged me to, do, you know, you shouldn't be thinking of it. Oh, I got to sacrifice this and give up this. No, it's like, oh, hey, I get to give this up. Hey, God, and, 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 and joy should come from this. That's another thing about Jesus teaching. He says, when you fast, don't walk around all mopey. Dina told me when I do my three-day fast, I'm like the worst person to be around because I'm hungry and, and everything's... <laughs> Jesus says, you're not supposed to be that way. Make up your hair, get out there, live your life like there's no difference. You're just spending time in extra prayer. So choose a fast, choose it joyfully, and be obedient joyfully in doing this. And I encourage you to deeper reading and study of God's word. I mean, that's always the case. But as we go through, we're going to talk about some pretty tough issues over the next few weeks. And however God makes that look, we're going to address the tough things. But I encourage each of us to submit whatever we think, believe, and to God's word and let him reveal his truth to us in every area. And your pastor is going to be doing the same. So this week, if you look on the back... There's a week-by-week -week thing that says you know, our, um, what the message is probably going to be focused upon that is subject to Holy Spirit change, okay? If the Holy Spirit says go a different direction, these subjects will change according to His direction. But I have prayed over this, and He felt that these were the areas that He wanted to, to, to focus in on. So this week, a season of intercession, prayer, and fasting was kind of the message for the day. This weekly fast, uh, prayer and focus, Fasting focus needs to be on personal repentance. Make sure that you have your spiritual lives and your spiritual relationship with Christ as clean as possible. Are there areas you need to ask for repentance in? Lord, I'm sorry. 
Are there areas in your life that you need to say, Lord, I need this cleansed up a little bit here. I recognize some dirt here that's starting to attach to my life. I want you to cleanse that away from me. Lord, I am getting myself focused and cleansed spiritually, personally, mentally. Your heart, soul, mind, and strength, all of you needs to be focused in on God. And spend this week. This is your personal selfish week. This is the personal selfish week. Say, Lord, fix me. Cleanse me. Make me better for you. That should be our focus through our prayers and our fasting of seeking purity before him. Make sure your heart, mind, soul, and strength are clean, right, and focused on God and his will. And I do ask for one special thing this week. On September, Friday, September 4th, I ask for you to do a day of fasting. Because this is the 60-day mark Friday. In 60 days from this upcoming Friday, the election will have happened. And the future direction of our nation will be pretty clear. We are praying, fasting, and seeking the future direction of this land in which we are walking through. We are seeking for its prosperity. We are seeking for its blessing because God says, I want you to bless the land in which you reside. Whatever land that is, he wants us to be a blessing unto it. And so all of these efforts, everything we're going to be talking about here is with that one thing in mind. How can I bless this place in which I am walking through as I get ready to spend eternity with God? We want to seek the best. We want to seek God's blessing. We want to see his changed, his power change people around us. We want to speak against the enemy's movement. And let me tell you, the enemy is moving very strongly and very powerfully right now. I think it's safe to say that me, probably none of us, I don't think since World War II and maybe the days of, of, of seeing Hitler himself walk across our, you know, the face of this earth, I don't think we've seen in the evil be as clear. Even during World War II, what Hitler was doing wasn't clear to the world. They didn't know. It was happening, but they didn't know it in real time. They found out after the fact all the evil that was going on. You and I, we're different. We're watching it happen in real time. And you and we have a responsibility to step in and say, enough. Jesus, we need you to come in and stop what we see going around. You have blessed us with a beautiful land to surge in, and we pray Thanksgiving for that. And we want to see it extend a little bit longer to your glory. As Dina pointed out, personally, I can see God's kingdom growing more because of America's fall than its continued existence in its lost state that it's in. America today is post-Christian going anti-Christian. And I see a lot of people rejecting God because of the American dream, freedom, liberty. I can do this because the government tells me I can. And they're rejecting God while doing so. I don't know if what outcome in November is actually the greater blessing for God's kingdom. But that's what I want to know. That's why we're doing this. Because we know if we intercede and we pray and we seek, whatever happens, we know God's got it. And we can trust him. And we can operate whatever conditions look like in November, December, and beyond until Jesus Christ returns. See, we're setting ourselves up to be more powerful in November. No matter. If one, if one action happens, you're going to have a whole lot of people really depressed. And if the other action happens, you're going to have a whole lot of other people really depressed. And one side is going to be awfully angry. If one happens, there's going to be a lot of anger, a lot of rage. Are we going to be there being able to be God's messenger in the midst of whatever happens? Are we going to be there ready to show Christ and to show God's kingdom and be a blessing upon the nation in which we've been put? 
The answer is yes, we are going to be able to. And this is what our journey together over this next 10 weeks is all about. That we as a church, New Harvest Church, will be the solid foundation that people seek no matter what happens. Because we have all of our faith and trust in Him, in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. I'm excited to join in this journey with you. I can't wait to hear what God says to you. If you spend time this way, if God reveals something to you and He speaks to you, I want you to share. Do not keep God's word and his blessings to yourself. This is something we're doing together and that we need to share with each other. We need to not share with this with each other, but we need to share it out to a world who's desperately needing what we're doing. Are you ready to be the change that God has for us to be? I know you are, Jim. <laughs> You guys have all helped me motivate. Actually, I can't. I can look at. I'm looking at every face right now, and I. I know we're all ready. Dear Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to you. We seek your will, no matter what, because we trust you. I have eternal life because of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You have changed me so much because of the Holy Spirit within me. I thank you for everything that you've done in my life. And I thank you for the blessing of being able to walk and surge through this nation, through this land at this time. You have blessed me to be part of this nation right now. And so, Lord, we all come together and we seek for your perfect will to be done for this nation. We ask that your grace and mercy be extended to those who do not know you. Oh, Lord, there are so many who do not know you. We ask for a season of national awakening, a spiritual awakening that has not been seen for hundreds of years, Lord. We desperately call and we intercede that people will wake up to who you are. Lord, may your kingdom grow exponentially. May the numbers of people who come and depend upon you as Lord and Savior be upon the billions of people that cannot be counted, Lord God. I pray this for worldwide, worldwide spiritual awakening because, Jesus, we know you're coming back soon. And we share your heart. We don't want to see any that they shall, be, shall perish, but all come to eternal life through you, Jesus. And we pray this first and foremost. Thank you, Jesus. And we humbly submit ourselves before you as throughout these next 10 weeks, we focus on a whole host of emotions and a whole host of issues, Lord. Each and every one of them we submit to you and only seek you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.